uh, Europe. Welcome all of you. Uh, thank you for taking part uh, and listening to uh, our Life Net Health Global Virtual Dental Symposium. I'm very excited to have today two fantastic uh, presenters, speakers on our stage. Uh, on the one hand, at first we have Professor Dr. Zamas Ruchi and from Israel, and then we have Dr. Ron Leff. They will talk today about um, their experiences in the dental field using allografts. Uh, at first, we have Professor Dr. Zamar Suruchi. And before, but before I will introduce him to you a little bit, uh, only briefly, um, I would like to uh, tell you some house rules. Of course, if you uh, listen to our sessions in the last couple of weeks, um, you know it maybe. You can use your question and answer button, frequent ask question button uh, in the Zoom field. Uh, you can ask question and after the presentation of uh, Professor Sergi, I will ask him this question on behalf of you. Um, for all the Spanish speaking attendees, please tune in your translating channel on the button by clicking on this small symbol. We have Dr. Ocombo. Um, from Colombia, um, also hola, que tal, uh, Dr. Ocombo, and thank you for synchronizing um, our presentation today. And one very important question um, in the end, if you dial out, you will get a very short survey, only three questions um, rating us and our uh, webinar so that we can improve ourselves. So who's the first presenter? We have Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Zama Suruchi uh, with us. Uh, Professor Suruchi is a double qualified DMD and PhD and um, a chief of oral and maxillofacial department at the Galilee Medical Center in Naharia in uh, Israel. Um, Professor Suruchi is in charge of the maxillofacial reconstruction surgery, endoscopic surgery, and the treatment of facial male formation. And of course, beside um, his clinical duties, he is an associated professor at the Galilei Medical Faculty uh, of Bar Ilan University and the head of the basic research lab. And he has um, uh, published um, over 50, 60 uh, publication in peer reviewed international journals. And today he will share some of his experiences with you, with us, and I'm very happy that we have you here, Zamar. Thank you uh, to be thank with you us. Very much. Um, I would like to give you the uh, stage. So the stage is yours. You can share your screen. Can you share your screen? Wonderful, wonderful, yeah. Okay, so uh, first, thank you, Peter. And uh, let me start with the, uh, my regards to all my colleagues all over the world. Uh, we are in difficult period and uh, here in Israel, there is a lack of lockdown. I hope everyone is uh, safe, he's uh, with his family. Um, I want to thank uh, the LifeNet Health Foundation for this invitation to share with you part of our uh, research about the bone regeneration and the role of the blood in this uh, process. First, I want to start to, from where I come from. And so our hospital is located in um, the north of Israel, it's the second big, biggest hospital in the north of Israel. It's in Naharia a city. And uh, we are, uh, uh, I'm the director of uh, the Oral Maxillofacial and Oral Medicine and Dentistry Institute. And we have in our institute three residency program, Oral Maxillofacial Surgery, Pediatric, Sur Pediatric Dentistry and Oral Medicine. Beside the advanced um, um, education programs for different uh, fields of the industry. 
Uh, so I want to start to uh, show you out my outline of the lecture, and I hope we can, uh, you know, continue at the end of this lecture. But if not, we can, you know, continue in other webinar in the in the future. So the first thing we will talk about the osseogenerative to orograft and talk about the mineralized orograft. Then I will show you the graftless sinus augmentation with blood as a graft. Uh, then we will talk about the concentrated growth factors, the plasma PRP and other uh, 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 about it. I will show you how to make the membrane, the sticky bone. I will show you clinical cases. We'll show you also some automated CGF, how we can do it automatically without uh, it's a new device that we developed uh, uh, in the last year. Uh, if we have time, so we'll talk about other development that we developed. It's called the faster fat assisted tissue regeneration, and I, I will show you the cases. So <clears throat> let's start. And this is this is what uh, the first thing that I want to show you, and this is the thing that we face every day in our clinic, which means which the best substitute or biomaterials we should use, what the osteoconductivity of these biomaterials, beside, of course, of its uh, build compatibility. And we have many research about it, but it's not um, what we call the sterile research. It's, you can't compare with every uh, uh, material and, and biomaterial. And the osteoconductivity, as you know, it's very important. And in briefly, osteoconductivity means a, pro a process to support the invasion of capillaries, prevascular tissue, or progenitor cells from the host to the 3D structure for the scaffold, for the uh, um, bone graft that you want to uh, graft it. And as you see here in this uh, uh, slide, many biomaterials we have in the market, but the osteoconductivity we know less and we have less potential to compare. So this is one of our research that we, we uh, for two years, three years, we uh, we just published in clinical or implant research about the evaluation of the conductivity of different biomaterials, and we used, as you see here, a mice model, an ectopic model, because we want to to test every biomaterials alone with cells and to understand which biomaterial can regenerate bone in ectopic model, ectopic model, it's mean that there's no way to have bone because there's no osteogenic micro environment uh, around. It. So what we did, you know, briefly, we take progenitor cell from two different um, uh, sources. We just seed it in different biomaterials, biosprestone, uh, we, we use the uh, uh, other uh, and, and, and uh, uh, life net. Uh, we use the uh, orograft, the mineralized, and we just make a construct and we just uh, um, transmit it in the back of the immunity, which is mice, because we use uh, human cells. So the first thing that we check is in my, in electron microscope, in the same microscope, not the same, uh, how the cell behave when seeded the biomaterials. And as you see here, you know, one of the things that we like to see is how the cell behave in the biomaterials. You know, if the cell, the progenitor cell, like the biomaterial, so he will be flat and he will make like a small layer that can hug the biomaterials, okay? And as you see here in this, in this biomaterials, you can see it's less hugging the, uh, and less flat on the uh, uh, biomaterial itself. So, the other step is to analyze the, uh, the results. So first is adhesion and proliferation. How it's mean adhesion in simple word, the uh, 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 cells, progenitor cells, do they like the biomaterials? And as we see here in the first day of adhesion that we see that two, these two biomaterials, almost the same to like this, uh, 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 to the cells like to be there. Then we check the proliferation, which means we put it in vitro, in assay in vitro, and we check how they proliferate. If they like it, they should proliferate nicely. And we see again here that uh, orograft, uh, mineralized, and prostone almost make the same. 
Then we uh, transplant it, as you see here, and it's in mud mice. And we start to analyze the result after eight weeks to see how, you know, it's ectopic. It's underneath the skin, so no way to have bone without cells. And uh, this is the result that we got. This is uh, histology H and D. And as you see here, this is uh, the orograph. You see here in this, this is the, 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 the experimental and this is the biomaterials only. Biomaterials only, you don't have any bone regeneration. And with the cells, this is the orograft, and this is the new bone, very nice new bone regeneration, as you see here. <clears throat> and uh, again, with a different source of uh, cells, again, as you see here, you can see the, the orograft, this is very nice regeneration, very nice cells regeneration, and again, the control, you don't have any uh, uh, generated bone. In other biomaterials, you have regenerated, but it's low less, and then we analyze it. And this is the result of the analyzing. As you see here, orograft is superior in all these uh, uh, biomaterials that we have. So it's, 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 we call it the sterile screening of, uh, of biomaterial, which means like the orograft mineralized work very good and it's superior in its conductivity. And this is, as I told you, it's published in clinical oral implant research two years ago. So let's start with the uh, bone healing and uh, it's healing generally. And it's, you know, it's, it's four phase healing, complicated, overlap phasing, and should be properly timed because we have hemostasis, we have inflammatory, and we have perforation and remodeling. And it starts as a frame, the clotting starts as a frame, framework or a process to stabilize all this process. Then we have the inflammatory phases, which is very important to release mediator cytokines to attract all the progenitor cells to reconstruct the vascularization in your graft. To uh, proliferate your cell of interest, your progenitor cells, so you will have at the end your graft success. And in all this process, which is complicated, we have many players, many players, and the main players, it's the platelets, the endothelial cells, EPCs, like I said, micro, ma macrophage, prevascular cells, osteoblasts, osteoprogenitors, many players, main players there, but we have also the, the, the gross factors, many gross factors, as you see here, is playing a crucial role to, to, for this healing uh, process in bone grafting and also in every uh, uh, healing process in our, in our body. So if we look at our blood, okay, and how it's related to this uh, regeneration or this healing, it's all what we have in bone healing or in healing, it's included in our blood. It's included in our plasma, not just the red cells we have here. We have the lipocyte, we have platelets, we have many um, um, growth factors, TGF, IGF, VEGF. And in the end, we have four components, which is very crucial for healing. It's the lipocyte, growth factor, platelets, which has inside also growth factors. So if we look to the frame, at, we have fibrin, fibrin net, which is the scaffold in our, in this plasma or in the concentrated plasma. We have the cross factors, we have the platelet, and we have very important cells. It's called CD34+, plus, which is part of the progenitor of the EPCs, of the epithelial cells, which is very important. We should understand it very good because in every procedure we disrupt vascularization and in the end of the procedure we should reconstruct vascularization and for these cells it's very very important. So I will show you how blood alone part of our research sorry so let's see how blood alone as a graft with all his component okay can be a scaffold 
So this is sinus lift that we all know. Okay, so we have sinus lift, and this is part of our research that we did a few years ago. We just lifting the sinus, put uh, implant, and we lift the the, the, the as blood as a scaffold, and and we uh, we published a few papers about it, and one of them was about graft with sinus augmentation in, in, in 2016. And it's simply we, what we did, we just make sinus lift, and we just let a blood clot to stay there stabilized. And we got very nice regeneration of bone without bone graft. And this is a, a part of our, I will, I will just go through because we don't have any time. But you, you see what bone gain we got just from bone. We bone 6.1 millimeter just gaining of bone without any graft because the blood make a, a big role of regeneration. And <clears throat> this is the biopsy that we got from two sides and we show that really there's full regeneration in, in, in the sinus just with blood. So the blood is powerful, the blood blood is powerful, our blood could be scuffled, which can act. And this is, you know, part of the biggest experience because we know that after extraction, we have also regeneration because of that blood. So just, and this is, you know, how just we uh, uh, thought about it from uh, uh, the regeneration uh, and the cells that regenerates the, uh, the sinus. And this is like a cartoon, a movie cartoon that show you when you just lift the sinus shindarium membrane and when you put the implant at the tent as effect of the tent and when you have the blood clot will all the factor with the growth factor with the fibrin with <coughs> cd35 everyone is there okay and they can attract operate differentiate the uh, the, the oil to uh, regenerate to the bone so let's go back to the fibrin net, as I told you before, four component, four important component. And if you want to think how we can obtain these. So the simple thing is to do, and I, I want to just to tell you from now, you know, I will show you the simplest method to concentrate, okay? And we'll go through it without complicated things, without complicated name, and uh, how, without completing central food and the, uh, and, uh, I will show you a little slide. So we can concentrate that um, fibrin again, fibrin, platelets, growth factor, and I could see it in very simple, uh, simple. So the first platelets, okay, briefly, okay, the most important thing for the platelets, and I will show you the same for this, okay, it's the alpha granules, okay, that you can see it here inside the platelet, okay, which is very, very <coughs> crucial, okay, to release growth factors, to release cytokines, okay, to attract other cells to regenerate, okay? And uh, we know that growth factor and cytokines can attract and proliferate uh, and differentiate the uh, other cells. Uh, again, growth factors, okay? So we have many growth factors. We can go through all these growth factors and their role in regeneration, but we have TGF, PDGF, FGF, VGF, EGF, IGF, one and two, Okay, all of them can be promote perforation, differentiation, angiogenesis, which is very important, and chondrotactyl, which is also uh, very important. Fair fibrin, uh, fibrinogen and fibrin, which is very important to give us, as I told you, the network, okay, the, the, the scaffold that everything should happen inside and be stabilized. So we have the protrombin activator, to be thrombin fibrogen to fibromonomer and then from being activated fibrin to stabilize the factor, then we have the cross link. You know, it's like we have a prothrombin, okay, we come to thrombin, from being activated fibrogen to fibromonomer, then the fibromonomer will become, as I will show you in the second slide. And, and this is very important because to stabilize your clot or your fibrin, it's one of the essential and crucial a role in, uh, in healing and when you graft any things in your uh, body. So, uh, if, and how we have a cross-linking, you know, it's a little bit complicated, but we go through it, you know, again, briefly, you can do it, you know, it's, it could be very nice. You can see as in this slide, you know, 
uh, how you make the, uh, the cross-linking. It should be also randomly. But, you know, briefly, it starts with one, one, slot, one, <coughs> one monomer, and then it's cross-linked with other tips here, and then it's one uh, to, um, add, added to other, and it's packing all the, uh, <coughs> the fibers together. Then you have a nice, very nice network that I will show you. So if we look about the classification of what we have today, you know, I will not go through this, but what can I tell you, you know, part of this is um, evidence-based, part not, part commercial, but you know, all of them, okay, it's, it's, it's a concentrated growth factors, which with lipids or with lipocytes and uh, with high density fiber matrix. Okay? And I'm telling you that because Part of our work we did in my lab, you know, we have a basic science lab dealing with tissue engineering and stem cells. And most of what I'm showing you here, it's based on our, uh, um, uh, in our lab uh, um, uh, work. So uh, at the end, you know, I want to, to make it very simple, okay? Uh, I, I'm just looking as a concentrated growth factor with two component liposide and high density fiber matrix. So how we can obtain plated growth factor concentration, you know, you can do, do it very simply. Sorry. So yeah, very simple centrifuge, you can do it. You just drop the blood, Use two, I will show you later, you use two tubes, one is red and one is the uh, 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 white. And then you can do it very simply with the assistant and it's, it's really simple procedure to do. The only difficult things maybe is to drop the blood, but I think everyone can, uh, can do it. Um, and then you can, after uh, seven minutes, you just uh, uh, use the, um, uh, your biomaterial that you uh, prepare and your uh, biological uh, membrane. And I will show you all the procedure in, in steps. So, uh, okay, as you see here, this is a st sticky bone and that you can use it and you have it after seven minutes if you decide to do it. Okay, so how we do it, you know, with the red cap, okay, the fiber matrix block uh, clot rich with liquefied CGF, you have it gel, okay, and the white cap, we use it as a glue for the sticky bone. So we have the red cap, you can call it for the membrane, and you can use it for activation for the sticky bone, I'll show you later. We have, you have the white cap, okay, and without any content, which will use it as a glue for the uh, sticky bone. So this is what we have after centrifuge, okay? And uh, we have the three, uh, three layers that we, we know. We have the PPP, the platelet uh, poor plasma, the platelet rich plasma, okay? And in the, in the, in the interface here, we have the lipid site, uh, in, in both uh, cups. This is what we got after seven. We have different technique, but you know, I don't like to make it complicated. So as I told you before, you know, I will not go through this different technique. I'm going to this very simple technique that everyone can do it in his uh, clinic. So uh, the simple, <coughs> simple uh, regeneration. So drop the, drop the, uh, the blood, okay seven minutes in simple centrifuge, okay, I will show you the parameters and you will have, after seven, you have, will have the jelly and you have the liquid, okay? Then you take, <coughs> this is the, uh, the jelly, this is the, uh, the, the jelly uh, part and uh, you can uh, obtain in a blood tube, it's about to 3,000 to 70 RPM for 7 to 10 minutes. It's about 300 G. And you just take it out from the tube and you have a, a, the component. As you see here, this CGF is like a small um, a <coughs> gel. 
uh, you know, this is the interface between the blood and the, uh, the gel itself. Uh, it's all the growth factor of the cell you have here. So it's obviously from it, angiogenesis, uh, perforate, fibroblast, osteoblast. It's all autological concentrate. Uh, you can use it in different clinical application that I will show you uh, later. Okay, so you can take it as you see here, you, know, you have different technique, make it simple as, as you can without different instrument, things that you have in, in your clinic that you can do it uh, very, very simple. So <clears throat> it's, so it rate switch plus this thrombocyte, plasma cytokine, lycocyte, growth factors for sure, and body, and it's all autological. Okay, then we have the autological fibrin, okay, that we use the same, okay, as I told you, with the a white cup, okay, and with the white cup, we have, as I showed you before, we just take that liquid, put the, <clears throat> uh, put the uh, uh, a bone, we just drop the liquid here from the white cup, then we drop our biomaterials and we'll have a sticky bone after a few minutes. Okay, and you can accelerate it by using the liquid from here and drop it here. It's very tricky and it's very nice to do it and to try it. You can just squeeze this, drop it here and you will have in a few seconds. So this is how it's look, you know, if you have a sticky bone, it's part of our paper, that what you have, you have your biomaterials, you have the fibrins network, is your scaffold, you have lycocyte, you have uh, platelets, and you have also gross factors. So you have everything here that you can use it, and you have from granules, okay, to putty bone. So you, you just bring granules, which is osteoconductive, to become a putty uh, bone to use it. Okay, this is how look in SIM. As you see, the fibrin, very nice biomaterial, very nice network net. Okay, as you see here, this is, is the platelets, as what you see here, it's very nice platelets. One of the things that we, we, we test is the, the release from uh, the CGF or from the phosphoretic tractors, okay? And in our lab, it's work at least for one week. So it's not just one for one week for releasing and we check also the functionality of these uh, factors and it's really worked very, very nice after one week. So it's not just for minutes, it's not for hours. It could be continue to work at least one week. Other papers show, you know, more for 80, uh, 28 days. Uh, we didn't, we can't see it, but um, uh, in, in our lab, it's worked between one week to uh, 12, uh, one week to 12 days with functioning work. So let me start with clinical cases and I will show you first, you know, this is a case, very simple case. You finish the case with implant and now what you have, you have a defect. So what you do, you take a graft and put it, but you can do it much simple, make it simple. You take your, <coughs> uh, uh, you make a sticky bone and you just put it as a putty, very, very nice. And in every case, we take a biopsy before uncovering. This is one of the things that we are doing all the time because we are ongoing research. About it. So very nice bone we got here. This is the scaffold and this is your new, bone and this is how it's after one year you see this is the panoramic and this is how after one year other cases that we used in maxillofacial as you see here this is um, a cyst a big cyst here as you see here and we need to regenerate it. And if we want to make it very big surgery, so we should take bone graft from the ileum and to graft it here. So we make it much easier. We just open it, take an aura graft, make a big sticky bone, and we just did it like this. And in the end, we have very nice regeneration here of the bone. This is the stuff. 
<clears throat> a cyst inoculation, another cyst inoculation here, dropping the blood, then you have to uh, use uh, the red and the white, then you go to the operation, make your graft, and in the end, very nice, after six months, very nice bone regeneration. It's very nice. This is the scaffold. This is the dead bone, and this is the new bone. Very nice new bone. <clears throat> Again, case of, I will show you now, with sinus left augmentation with the CGF, and this is the case. You take the CGF, just put it as I show you before, you can just put it underneath Schindlerian membrane, then you take the, the sticky bone and close your window here. This is the, uh, the result, as you see in the uncovering, you take again biopsy here. And this is how we did in the movie, you can see, we just lift the membrane, drilling, take a CGF and, and take the putty bone and just we can close the window with a, this very nice sticky bone. One of the advantages of this sticky bone is, you know, because it's not ground, it's, it's very stable, so you can play it with your fingers, where you're, with your instrument, which make it very simple to work with. Okay, this is other case of immediate implant. As you see here, we just ex extract the, uh, uh, and you have here defect and you want just to make a bone graft. Again, you can do it very nice. You know, this is the sticky bone. You just take it with your finger and you can make it as dense as you want to make it dense. Okay, and you just put it and then you can, <clears throat> After you put it, you can use also the membrane to close all these uh, uh, the biological membrane uh, above this sticky bone and will make the healing much, much better. This is how it's look. And, and this is uh, after one month and this is after one year. Vertical augmentation, it's very tough cases. You know, as you see here, we can't, you do any things here because so we did the vertical augmentation with the mesh uh, titanium and we use also again orograft with a sticky bone putty bone we just uh, make it very dense in this area and again put a membrane biological membrane above everything here and just close it as you see here <coughs> And uh, this is after uh, two years, acceptable results. And uh, it's, it's perfect, no, no infection and no inflammation. And this is part of our, uh, our, our uh, research, ongoing research that showing, you know, we have part of patient that split it, part with, with, with sticky bone and part with, with not. And we showed that the sticky, with the sticky bone, we have more regeneration of bone. We can't publish it because it's still in bone. But as you see here, very nice. This is the graft and this is the new bone in, in CGF with regeneration. It's worked nice and really uh, uh, hope it, uh, the end of this year we can publish something about it. This is something that I want to show you about uh, <clears throat> our new automide. We, we just developed it with a, a company, medical company about uh, how we can make all this procedure much simple because you don't need for sticky bone, you don't need the caps, you don't need the reds, you don't need, you just drop in, in special. Um, okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is how so it's called bioactive bone. Uh, so you can use here also the graft. And, and again, we want to enhance angiogenesis, proliferation, a differentiation and migration okay and to do it 
as I show you before, you know, to have a nice net, net okay, with all the factor with activated platelets. And it's, it's like this when we can use it with a sticky bone, okay, uh, we believe that the active uh, a bone can be regenerated much, much uh, uh, higher or superior. So this is the, it's uh, something that we developed uh, like a cup, special cup, and uh, we just put it in centrifuge after we put it we can uh, have directly um, sticky bone, okay? So you can push it or you can take it and put it and uh, this is that we uh, you know, hope it will be in the market in the future. We hope that it will be something that we can uh, do. So if we want to conclude, <clears throat> I hope I, uh, okay, I'm over time. So I try to conclude now and we will skip the faster the thing that I uh, show you maybe later. Otherwise, Peter tell me something else. But um, a CGF conclusion, it's autologous concentrate, supports cell differentiation and proliferation, it's proved. And I'm telling you it's proved because also part of, of my student, the master student or Missy student that's doing to take it and check it in vitro in cells and to see if the CGF as a medium could be continued for perforation and differentiation. Support angiogenesis and promote new vascularization, accelerate hearing. It's a putty bone, easy to handle and to manage. I think everyone is, uh, agree with that. It's a biological barrier and for sure it's a low cost. Uh, you can do it very simple, simple centrifuge, simple cups, and you can just uh, do it perfect and uh, apply it in your uh, clinic. So again, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, LifeNet um, Health Foundation, Peter and everyone, and uh, hope we can continue. If I have time, I can continue. If not, I should stop because the other, other slide, it, it about faster, about the uh, fat assisted with, uh, with blood. But uh, it's depend on Peter and uh, the schedule for today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Samer, uh, for the fantastic presentation. Um, indeed, we are a little bit over time, but we, we, we started a little bit um, later today. But I can tell you all, all over the world who are listening to us, um, we will continue with this fantastic uh, webinar sessions also in 2021. So um there's also plenty of time uh in the next sessions um we will see um there are some questions for you uh some are double i have to read them what type of bone are you using cortical or cancellous what is your preparation um you know it's um you know I, i'm using the mineralized cortical a uh, cortical cancellous is also good now you know it's uh, but you know for for me you know in, in, in clinical results okay uh, i can i can't see big difference okay between the corticals and the cortic cancers i can't see it okay but you know there's different research about it you know who prefer cortic and um, in my uh, clinical results, okay, it's uh, it's almost the same for me. There's another. What type of aura craft you use for the vertical ridge augmentation, demineralized, Again. or which type of aura craft you use for vertical ridge augmentation, demineralized, or mineralized ground cortical? Just mineralized. You know, I'm I'm using yeah. just mineralized bone. Just you know, I'm not yeah. I'm I'm not dealing for with demineralized. Yeah. And how long uh, will it take the time of healing? Ah, oh, this is quite a, a difficult question. <laughs> Depending you know, on the... uh, you know, it's uh, if, if I want to continue, I can show you. You know, we, we have many going research about it. You know, but what can I show? We have very nice project of CGF coated with you know with with uh, 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 with uh, granules and. I can tell you it's the, the results show healing 
um, you know, I, I can't show shorter healing, but what can I show that 15% of the bone more mature when CGF, okay? Which means it's faster, okay? So, you know, it's we done with, we have a very nice research that it's done now with dogs and uh, it's really nice results. Uh, we can't, you know, because it's, we do it in dogs and, you know, it's the biggest animal that we can use it. So we can do it, you know, with different, with different time, but we can conclude from the uh, uh, regeneration and from the new bone that we got. Okay, so it's something that I hope in the future that we can publish and we yeah. can discuss it later. The last, the last question, maybe uh, if you stay then longer, maybe after uh, Ron's uh, presentation, we can answer some more questions. There's very short answer, 70, 30. Would it be better in sake of volume to use, Again? To use a, a 70, 30 mixture? Ah, it's it's about the volume. How how yep. to use that? Yeah. Peter, I didn't hear you. Sorry, it was again. So, um, if you would use the seventy thirty mixture, would this be better in the sake of volume? Uh, if you this. Maybe <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure about it, but, but maybe it would be good. <laughs> okay, so. Um, if you stay there, thank you again. Um, we will switch over to uh, to Ron uh, Lev. Now I have to switch my <clears throat> um, Clarissa. Can you switch off? Yes, fantastic. So um, our second speaker today. Sorry, Ron. We <laughs> we were already over the time a little bit. Um, Ron Leff, um, thank you that uh, you will also take uh, uh, a place in our dental seminar today. Um, maybe uh, some of you uh, already know Dr. Ron Leff. Uh, he, is, he graduated uh, dentistry of, and master of science at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Um, his specialty is in periodontology and he's special, specialized there uh, from the dental school at Tel Aviv University. And he served as the head of the Department of Periodontology at the Center of Dental Medicine in Sheba Hospital in Israel, where he still teaches um, uh, till today. And uh, he is an active, or he was an active um, past president of the Israeli Society of Periodontology and Osseo Integration. And in his private clinic, uh, he is restricted to periodontology again and implantology. Thank you, uh, Ron, to be here. The stage is yours. You can now share your screen. Uh, Summer, we will switch your video off and your mic off. All right. Thank you very much, Peter, for the kind presentation. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Um, so first, some thank yous, uh, David, Peter, Clarissa, and everyone at the LifeNet Health for the opportunity to share the screen uh, with some other remarkable speakers uh, in your amazing initiative of the Global Virtual Symposium. I saw most of the previous uh, webinars and I hope to be up to par with the previous speakers. Um, Thank you, Fanny Gross and HA Systems, the local distributor of LifeNet in Israel for trusting me the second year in a row and for years of cooperation and friendship. And to my partner in crime, Dr. Michael Solomonov, uh, who is a truly remarkable person, uh, most gifted in the dentist and the most enthusiastic dentist I, I ever met. And the most of the work you will see today is our joint effort. And last but not least, dear colleagues, thank you for all of you that uh, have, have taken the time to join me for this uh, short presentation. So uh, I will try to stick to the time schedule. Uh, this is uh, Vienna last year, 2019 in the LifeNet Symposium. So uh, you can see Peter here that is very good with selfies as well. You can see the Israeli delegation last year with Fanny Gross and the 
a lot of uh, our friends and Dr. Alberto uh, Monge, who also gave a great speech uh, last week. So uh, little did we know last year that this year will be so different so that the Global 2020 Symposium will be online webinar. And last year when I went next to the hotel in Vienna to the um, Klimt uh, exposition, so I saw the pictures and I saw people taking photos and I just, uh, today I just realized that everyone today is looking through the smartphones and laptops instead of looking at the big picture. So and maybe we have also some few advantages of that. Um, so the time schedule is a bit tight, but still uh, I'm sure that Lightnet will not object if I steal 30 seconds to remind us that October is uh, dedicated to raise awareness to breast cancer. And one of eight women will suffer from breast cancer in her life. So please get checked, it may just save your life. Here I'm running uh, in pink with my wife to raise awareness for breast cancer. It's one of the few things we can still do during our COVID uh, lockdown. So uh, just a little disclosure before I start. The lecture is sponsored by LifeNet Foundation and the cases you're gonna see here are cases that were treated in uh, the private practice with uh, Dr. Solomonov. You can see him with me over here. Uh, or at the Center of Dental Medicine at the Shiva Hospital. I'm married to an endodontist and a very, very good one. And I'm father of three endoperio lesions, quite complex ones. So I have learned quite a lot about endo. And uh, this is some of the team that we work together in the private uh, practice. And let's start. So the um, interaction between me as a periodontist and my fellow endodontists may be in several clinical situations or indications. As you can see the list here, but today we will not have time to discuss all of these indications. So I'll just focus on some main topics, which will be the cervical invasive resorption, the complex apical surgeries and the combined perio and lesions. So let's start with the cases. That's the first case. This case I, did, I treated with Dr. Avi Levine uh, when he was a resident in the endo uh, program in the uh, center of Dental Medicine at Shiva Hospital. So this is a 22 year old guy. He's healthy, he has no complaint, and he was referred due to a cervical and a periapical radiolucency, as we see here on the X-ray. It's in tooth number 21. And in his dental history, we can see that there's an untreated dental trauma, something like 10 years ago. And when we do the clinical examination, we can see that there's a loss of cervical enamel in the palatal area with a gingival ingrowth. There's healthy periodontal tissues. The tooth is non-vital. There's no sensitivity to percussion or propation. And when we look at the x-ray, we can see the cervical uh, distal radiolucency. We can see the periapical radiolucency, no loss of interdental bone. And the apical radiolucency is still the apical third of the root. So uh, when you have to diagnose a tooth like that, so the diagnosis will be uh, palp necrosis, asymptomatic apical periodontitis, and a cervical root resorption. Uh, this would be a class three by a uh, header cell. So our treatment plan for this case would be first of all the root canal treatment because it's a non-vital tooth with an asymptomatic um, apical periodontitis. Then we'll go on with forced eruption because we would like to treat the uh, cervical lesion, which will be in a supracrestal position. We'll do a CD scan to see that we are in the right position and to plan our surgery. And then our surgery will be a kind of a crown lengthening procedure in this uh, uh, case, somewhat of a gingivectomy, debridement of the resorbing tissue and the restoration of the tooth. So let's, let's see how it goes. So first the root canal treatment done by Dr. Avi Levine, the forced eruption in our ortho, ortho department. It was between two to three months. Then we did the CT, CT scan and we can see that the resorbing tissue is now supercrestal. It's much easier to treat this way. Now we went on, sorry, to the surgery. There's a submarginal incision. Um, we took out the resorbing tissue. We can see through the mirror that uh, now that uh, um, tooth is clean and there's no more resorbing tissue. 
then uh, we uh, restore the tooth with glass ionomer cement. And when we see the um, re-evaluation and the radiological follow-up, so that's the initial picture during surgery, which is after the root canal therapy and the forced eruption. And then 10 months later, we can see the healing after the root canal therapy. We can see that there's no further resorption in the cervical area and uh, it looks very stable. Uh, we published um, a decision-making tree um, that we developed for the treatment of cervical resorptions according to the location of the lesion and the width of the entry point. You can see uh, it's graphically here in this slide. Uh, for example, just let's see a tooth. This tooth, um, it has an infracrestal uh, uh, stage four resorption by Heather say. It looks hopeless, but due to the narrow entry point, the endodotists can do really magic with that because they can do an internal endor approach. And here we can see the same tooth five years later that it is still in function so that they can do really uh, miracles. And uh, this is here another uh, example of uh, treating a cervical invasive resorption in the private clinic where we did uh, simultaneously uh, also a coronally positioned flap to treat uh, the gingival recession and it's stable after six months. You can see the restoration we did during the day of the surgery. It's stable after six months and also we could uh, gain healthy tissues and uh, cover the um, root recession. The next case is a case of a 23 year old lady her chief complaint was pain and swelling buckle to teeth 11 and 12. The teeth were non-vital. Again, there's a history of a dental trauma, something like eight years ago. She was treated in the private clinic with Dr. Michael Solomonov. Uh, the diagnosis was pulp necrosis and acute apical abscess. Um, the treatment plan was to first do the root canal treatment, then to do the CT scan, and then to do a joint apical surgery with me and Dr. Solomon together. Um, but uh, plans change, you know. Uh, so a few days before the date of the surgery, she showed up uh, at the clinic with pain and a remarkable swelling of the vestibular area. So I performed the vestibular drainage and also prescribed antibiotics and we postponed the surgery for something like eight weeks. You can see here the CV scan, you can see uh, how extensive the lesion is and that we uh, don't really see a buccal bone plate in the CD scan. Um, surely enough, when we elevated the flap eight weeks later, we saw that the bony plate was almost full, uh, just almost intact, just a small perforation that we could see after we elevated the flap. So actually this is not so unusual uh, we do see this often that uh, the CT scan shows uh, like shows a picture that we can guess that there will be no bony plate, but there's kind of a washout of the very, very thin bony plate. And when we raise the flap, we still see sometimes a bony plate. Here there was a uh, flap elevation with infracircular incisions with the one releasing vertical incision distal to the canine. There was a pus draining through the um, uh, fenestration here. Uh, we opened it up, uh, did a debridement of all the uh, tissues there. And this would allow uh, Dr. Solomonov a uh, good access there to do the um, retrograde uh, preparation, obturation of the root. So that's the next stage, which, is, which was done by Dr. Solomonov. You can see through the micro mirror here, the gutta perca and the roots the two roots, we did the apicoectomies. We can see that sometimes we do a staining of the roots just to make sure that there is no vertical root fractures. Then the apical obturation with the uh, IRM. And then the regeneration. The, when we have uh, lesions that are so wide, and this, one, this was a very, very wide lesion, uh, more than 10 millimeters in diameter, uh, even, closer to 20, 25 millimeters. So we do a regeneration. Uh, I use the DFDBA and the resorbable collagen membrane. 
and then the suturing with the monofilaments with uh, um, sling sutures and simple sutures. And here we can see the reevaluation after surgery, six months after surgery. The, we can see the, um, the histopathology of a radicular cyst. And we can see six months post-op. We can see it's uh, with a healing process. It's not uh, fully done, but when we compare it to the day of the surgery, we can already see a feel of a mineralized tissue. And uh, I know that it is new tissue because I've used the DFDBA. So the DFDBA is radiolucent and it's fully resorbed by three to six months. So I know that the um, mineralization that I see in the uh, six months post-op is probably uh, uh, from new uh, tissue being mineralized in this area. And it, I can appreciate the healing of the um, endodontic lesion. We can see a similar case treated the same way. This is another uh, a similar case with a very extensive uh, periapical lesion. In this case, there was a fenestration of the buccal and palatal bony walls, and it was treated the same way uh, with an um, epicoectomy, with an uh, allograft uh, collagen membrane, and you can see the picture after six months, also with a uh, during a healing process, it's not complete yet, but probably when we have lesions which are so extensive, it will take some more time to get them uh, fully healed. And maybe sometimes they won't be fully healed, but still a, a healing process. The next case is a case that I treated uh, again with Dr. Solomonov in the private practice, just something like um, three to four weeks ago. So it's very, very fresh. Um, that's a 36 year old lady. She was referred by an endodontist with tooth number 21 uh, that uh, showed no um, healing six months after being treated by root canal therapy. And with an apical sinus tract that uh, uh, was a recurrent sinus, uh, uh, sinus tract that a uh, uh, few months after it disappeared, it just showed again. She has a high lip line with an asymmetric gingival uh, um, recessions. We can see the recessions, especially at two, teeth number 23 and 24. She has high aesthetic demands. You can't see that here, but she is planning on doing more uh, aesthetic uh, dentistry uh, later on. So uh, our diagnosis in this case is previously treated to tooth. Uh, the uh, lesion here is not as extensive as we've seen in the previous uh, case. Um, it's a chronic apical abscess. Um, we can know it by the sinus tract that is uh, apparent here. Uh, our treatment plan would be a CD scan, a apical surgery. And if we're doing surgery, why not uh, uh, do also root coverage um, to save her some time and some morbidity. So that's a pre-op uh, uh, photo, and we can see here the gingival recessions with the tooth 24 with a three and a half millimeter recession and tooth 23 with a two millimeter. I did some root planning before raising the flap. And here, because she has a very, very high lip line, uh, I didn't want to uh, utilize any um, vertical incision. So we'll have no scarring in the aesthetic zone. So I used here the um, Zucchelli technique. I'm a great fan of Giovanni Zucchelli. Uh, and here it's the modified coronary advanced flap technique with the oblique incisions in the papillae um, with a split full split thickness flap elevation, a deep utilization of the anatomic papillae. Here you can see some of the cool uh, equipment that Dr. Solomonov has, very, very flexible files rotatory uh, instruments to do the retrograde root canal preparation. You can see also the uh, obturation here. He really does a remarkable job. Uh, the lesion here was not so extensive. It was something like between five to eight millimeters in diameter. So I did not use an allograft here, just a collagen membrane, a resorbable collagen membrane. And I sutured the flap with a currently positioned uh, uh, um, flap. You can see here the sutures, which are um, sling sutures, and you can see 
the teeth 23 and 24, which have the two to three and a half millimeter recessions that were covered. So as I said earlier, it's a very, very fresh case. I just treated it something like uh, a little bit less than four weeks ago. Tomorrow she's coming for the one month checkup. So that's two weeks post-op. You can see the, uh, that uh, we still have full coverage after two weeks. It's still too soon to know, but it looks quite good with the red tissue showing the angiogenesis there. Um, if you invite me again next year, I will probably have to see uh, if uh, the result is stable or not. So you'll just uh, have to wait and see together with me. Uh, the next case uh, was uh, quite an ambitious one. Uh, also quite a fresh case. It was uh, treated just something like two months ago in the private clinic, again with Dr. Solomonov. It's an 81 years, year old man. Uh, he's healthy. Uh, his chief complaint was pain and swelling buckle to teeth number 11 and 12. Uh, the teeth are non-vital and there's a hypermobility grade three. Uh, the history on these teeth were um, root canal treatment and retreatment of tooth number 12 uh, uh, five years ago. Four years ago, there was a root canal therapy in tooth 11. And we can see the x-rays from 2016 to 2018. It seems a bit better and then it got a whole worse at 2020. Um, our diagnosis is previous, uh, previously treated teeth, symptomatic apical periodontitis, and our treatment plan will be a CD scan, and then an apical surgery with uh, histopathology. So if we see the CBT, CBCT scan, uh, the lesion seems to be very, very extensive. It, uh, from it, in the apical area, it really reaches the palatal root of uh, the first premolar, and you see it uh, palatal to the canine. You can see it all uh, over the lateral, lateral incisor. It's the worst between the central and the lateral incisor with the fenestration of the bony plate. And also at the central incisor, almost reaching to the incisive canal. So it's a very, very big uh, lesion. And um, the mistake, I did was not insisting on uh, placing a temporary bridge from tooth 13 to tooth 21 because it was very, very hypermobile. But with teeth that are uh, with such a questionable prognosis, then the dentist doesn't really want to change the crowns and take out the crowns because he doesn't know if the teeth will stay in place. So we said, okay, we'll do it this way, we'll do a splint. And uh, it was very, very uh, uh, problematic during surgery. Uh, you can see here the flap elevation with the intracircular incision and a vertical uh, releasing incision, distal to the canine. There was an uh, alveolar fenestration with a yellowish uh, soft tissue, which is really um, like we saw in the CT scan between tooth 12 and 11, we saw that we have a fenestration there. And we did the debridement, Dr. Solomonov did the apicoectomy and did the preparation of duration of the teeth. And actually when he did that, I actually had to hold the teeth with my finger, like you see here on the canine, I had to hold the uh, incisors because when he did the preparations, he would have uh, extracted the teeth if I won't hold them with my finger like that. So it was um, a little funny, but uh, uh, quite difficult to manage. Um, it was a very, very extensive lesion. So uh, as our protocol uh, says, we did use a regenerative therapy with an allograft, a DFDBA, and a, a resorbable collagen membrane. The suturing, like we saw before, with the monofilaments, a sling and simple sutures at the vertical incision. And we see the splinting that we did at the end of the surgery. So then he came back um, three weeks later and the splint fell off. Uh, meanwhile, we got the uh, um, biopsy back with a periapical granuloma uh, diagnosis. Uh, I did some occlusal adjustments and he's really trying not to use the teeth 
so much. Um, he's consuming uh, milkshakes and uh, cheeses and stuff like that. And uh, he, because he's really afraid to bite on these teeth. So six weeks post-op, the tissues look uh, quite nicely. I mean, uh, soft tissue wise. Uh, and I can already see an improvement of the hypermobility of the teeth, uh, but it's still too soon. Again, we'll see next year how the healing goes. And if we can save those teeth, I will be so glad. The last case I'm going to show you is a case that uh, was done in the center uh, of dental medicine in the Sheba hospital by uh, uh, two of our uh, great students when they were residents, Dr. Yael Arbel in the period department and Dr. Alex Lebovsky in the endo department. Both, are already, both of them are already a specialist today and quite brilliant ones. So this was also a very fun case. When you see a tooth like that, then 95% of the dentists will say, that, if not 99%, take this tooth out. What do you have to do with this tooth? He's a 32 year old uh, guy with a recurrent abscess in tooth number 11. And you can see the gingival redness. There's a deep pocketing, but it's only in the buccal area of tooth number 11 to 12 millimeters. There was an inconclusive vitality test. His diagnosis was a true combined perioendo lesion. Uh, and he also has a perio diagnosis of a molar incisor type periodontitis stage three grade C because he also has signs of a periodontal disease in a, a two molars. Uh, what once we used to call localized aggressive periodontitis. So he underwent uh, first an anti-infective therapy. You can see that the tissues look uh, much pinker, less uh, inflammation. Uh, he cleans much better, but still there's the gingival swelling and redness buckle to tooth 11. So now uh, they did the splinting before, like we should do. There's, uh, they utilize a single flap technique. They raise the flap. You can see the extensive lesion there, um, but the, the lesion is very deep, very cir circumferential, but it involves only the buccal and uh, interdental area. So here the, there was also a root canal therapy did, done in the same uh, procedure and um, a perio regenerative surgery. Uh, and we just used all the ammunition we have. So that's also an uh, uh, enamel matrix derivative application, also an allograft and a cross-linked uh, absorbable collagen membrane. You can see the suturing, monofilament, colony position flap. We try to do uh, as much papillary, papillary preservation techniques as we can, uh, follow up after two weeks and after a month. Uh, and then after six months, they removed the splint. There was physiologic mobility probing up to three millimeters. And we can see the x-rays, the initial x-ray on the day of the surgery with the uh, root canal therapy and the splint and six months just before uh, the splint removal. And it's really fun to do sometimes magic. And it's probably uh, not as predictable uh, but when we in in the academy we can do in academics we can do everything and it's really fun to see uh, such great results so when we talk about decision making sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes it's easy like this person here okay so it's sometimes it's more difficult uh, and today we're going to discuss a little bit about biomaterials in periodontal surgery, what to use when and when to use. Not a lot of literature in this uh, uh, um, about that. So we have a quite nice review by von Arx from 2011, where he did uh, uh, recommend the usage of uh, biomaterials, especially when we have tunnel lesions, when we have a loss of bony plates, buccally and palately. Uh, and if we have a combined perioendo lesions with a full dehiscence of the buccal bony wall, like we saw in the last case, and there's a debate about large periapical lesions if they're over 10 millimeters. In the small lesions, it's not recommended and it's inconclusive in the large periapical lesions between five to 10 millimeters, but not a lot of literature on that uh, topic. 
Um, when we're talking about uh, different uh, materials we can use, so we can talk about xenorafts, l plasts and l grafts. So xenorafts have been uh, discussed the most in the literature. The most evidence is about xenorafts. Actually, I love using xenorafts, but not for this indication. I use them for GBR, for science grafting. I usually mix them with l grafts, similar to what Dr. Zamarani showed two weeks ago in his great uh, speech here. Um, uh, so the xenograft, the main problem with the xenograft in uh, periapical surgeries is that it uh, really masks periapical healing. They're non-resorbable and they're very, very radio opaque and they're staying there for good. So we really don't know if there was or wasn't an endodontic healing. So that's why I don't like using xenograft in periapical surgeries. The alloplasts I also don't like. Some of them are resorbing too fast. Others don't resorb. They have no osteogenic activities and also very, very um, low on evidence. And the allografts, it makes a lot of sense. They're fully resorbable in three to six months. They're also conductive or even also inductive if we're talking about some of the research about the DFDBA but not a lot of evidence. I mean, there's only few. So it will still be our primary choice because of the biological plausibility, but not a lot of literature. There's this case series from India and another research in uh, Egypt, but not a lot. So actually my recommendation is to promote more research and actually we're trying to collect more and more cases in the last year or two. So hopefully we can come up with a, a more extensive uh, uh, case series or maybe even a, a, a randomized control trial. But our team protocol is, for now is to do uh, always CT scan to plan our surgeries, to do an interdisciplinary approach, utilizing two surgeons, a periodontist and an endodontist together, uh, it's much more fun and it's a better result because each one is dealing with the uh, best tools he has. Uh, we use biomaterials in tunnel lesions uh, where we have missing bony walls and if it's very extensive lesions over 10 millimeters, I usually use the DFDBA and the resorbable collagen membranes and I try to do a coronary position flap and papillary preservation technique whenever I can. So uh, teamwork, teamwork, these are some of the guys that, uh, uh, I, uh, that helped me in my work and in the uh, cases we saw here today. And uh, I try to be uh, on schedule with time. So now if there's any question, I will be more than happy, Peter. Okay. Thank you very much, Ron. It was fantastic uh, speech. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting. And I already have the first questions here. Um, do you disinfect the periapical lesions or just deprive the tissue? And uh, if you disinfect, what would you use or what are you using? I'm debriding the tissue and usually I'm just wash wash it with a, um, a sterile saline solution, not more than that. Uh, actually, I, I'm, I don't like using chlorhexidine too much inside those uh, lesions because chlorhexidine uh, has sometimes a detrimental effect on fibroblasts and sometimes about uh, on osteoblasts, even epithelial cells. So I don't like using uh, chlorhexidine in these uh, uh, areas. So just sterilized cell and solution. Okay, thank you. You spoke about something from um, Dr. Arks. And there is a question also, why did you choose the IRM and not the MTA? Uh, because it's much easier to use the IRM and the MTA sometimes washes away. There's sometimes a washout, especially if the area isn't as dry as we like. And the IRM is really, really stable and we get a, a very, very good results with that. Okay. Um, there is a question from um, uh, Javier Hernandez. Uh, Carlos, if you can translate me this into English, please. Peter is repeating the question from before. It, uh, why not use 7030 with respect to, uh, as opposed to uh, just uh, the demineralized cortical? 
um, wouldn't it uh, give you a more predictable and rapid result? Okay, that's a good question. I'll answer. Uh, it, it's it, it's okay to use a 70-30, and I just like to use usually the DFDBA because it's very radiolucent. So uh, when I take the uh, x-ray uh, post-op, I, I see that there's no mineralized tissue, and then I know later on that all the mineralized tissue is new <clears throat> tissue. So that's why I like to do the DFDBA. And also the, there is uh, some research that the DFDBA is the most osteoinductive. But when we, we talk about uh, if we'll need more, uh, something that will give us more stability in the volume, then uh, you can use the 70-30 sometimes if there's very extensive lesions and you don't have almost any buckle plate. So you can also use that. Yeah, thank you. Um, there is um, there is the question. Let me um, the peripical uh, lesion would uh, ah, it's the same one. The um, DFDBA and FDBA as a mixture um, should be better than the DFDBA alone. Okay. Same same answer. Yeah. Yes. 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 Same answer. Um, there is uh, there is one question for. Uh, Summer, uh, Clarissa, can you switch uh, the camera from Summer on? Now I, I see, I see in. Ah, yeah, there he is. Uh, Summer, there's a question for you. Would a bone graft that helps to stabilize a clot and has the growth factors offer advantages over other bone materials. Again, it's, it's uh, about, they're talking about the sticky bone. Again, the, the, the uh, advantage of other biomaterials, you know, you can use it, you know, first sticky bone, you can use it with every biomaterial that you wish. And uh, <clears throat> so the advance is not it, the, the TGF or the sticky bone, the advances is not in biomaterials. It's in the construct that you will have around it, okay, which is the fibrin, lycosides, growth factor, and other. So the advantage is in the structure around, um, not just in, um, um, inside the biomaterials, it's more about the uh, uh, what happened after you grafted, which mean uh, you, um, if it's regular bone graft, let's, uh, let's start, you know, from a case that you take granules and you just graft it. So the bone healing will go with the phases of hemostasis, inflammatory, progression, differentiation, and so on. So when you use the construct of the sticky bone, what you will have is enhancing of the healing, okay? So it's not matter which biomaterial you use, it's matter the construct that you use. This is the, uh, the issue in, in using the CGF. Yeah. So you can use different biomaterials, you can use xenograft, you can use synthetic biomaterials, okay? But the concept is to enhance the healing or to enhance the regeneration. And this is what I show you in my biopsy and my histology that regenerated bone uh, can be superior with using this uh, uh, method. And, uh, and, and, and this is the, the, the concept, you know, it's, it's, it's the using of CGA for the concentrated factors or the concentrated uh, plasma. It's, 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 as I showed, it's not a commercial, you know, it's, you can use the centrifuge that you wish, you can use the tube that I show you, and you can use it very simple with no other tricks and tips about. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is another Spanish question. Can someone translate this, please? Yes, it says, uh, I mix normally PRF and graft, and I use uh, PRF on the uh, voids. What do you think about this? In what? What what mean voids? In what? The voids, the spaces uh, uh, between uh, bones. It should be. It should be work good. So the you know, question is, 
mix of PRF with the allograft and places that into the cavity. It should, uh, with, it, it, it's not sticky bone. You think about, you know, the taking a PRF and just mix it together. This is the, this is the question because, you know, let me, let me, you know, just to um, clarify it, you know, if you take just what we call the PRF, the, uh, the gel, okay, and you just mix it with the bone, okay, and you put it, okay, it's one procedure. And if you make the sticky bone, okay, yeah, how I show you a different procedure, and 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 it should be clarified because when you make the, when you take a PRF and you just uh, mix it with the granules, okay, the clotting procedure already done. So you just take all the the the, the factor or the cell and you drop it in the in the granules. So the clotting is not in the same time when you have a sticky bone. So the, the nice thing in sticky bone is that you use, you make the clotting with the bone, with the biomaterials, okay, in the same, in, 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 in the same round, okay. So the net, if you take, if you take the same picture, okay, electron microscope picture with PRF with granules, you just, after you, you got the PRF and you just um, mix it and you have, you will have, you will not have this nice, nice net uh, between the biomaterials, okay, and the fibrins, fiber, okay, and all the uh, content, okay. But when you make the sticky bone, okay, so you will have like very nice spider uh, uh, structure that the bio the biomaterials is stuck inside this net, and this is the nice the different things between using. A, what we call the glue sticky bone and just using the PRF and just to uh, mix it with the bone. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's, it's work different, okay? It's released different and it's handling different. Yeah, thank you very much to clarify that. Uh, there's another, can we inject antibiotics in the blood tube before the centrifugation and uh, then obtain PRF clot with antibiotic concentrations? I, 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 I think, you know, you can use antibiotics. I, I don't think it's, it's made any, any, any change any, in the, the conference, you know, uh, yeah. it could be good good idea. And there is another question. What is the difference between PRF and PRP in action? No, it's a, I, I, you know, I try to, uh, to, to, uh, to run from, from these questions because, because, you know, it's a little bit to escape about it because, you know, it's the same concept. Okay. But, you know, it's a um, platelet rich plasma. Okay. Or, 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 or platelet rich fibrin. Okay. It's, it's the, the same con, con, uh, the same concept with different con, uh, with different uh, uh, um, structure okay so if it's PRF it's it's you know you see this jelly if it's PRP it's it's liquid and you know it's it's something that the more uh, um, you know how you market how you, you you say it you know I I I don't I, it's it's very good to know what is PRP it's very good to know what's PRF. Uh, but I believe, you know, from my work in, in our lab, you know, it's the difference is it's not well based as 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 we see in the market. You know, it's uh, it's yeah. I feel that it's more commercial than it's it's real. Uh, it's really how to work. Yeah. So now the, the my my, my, my what is you know, my, my <laughs> advice my advice my advice make it simple as you can. You know, uh, uh, to make to give the. Uh, in, uh, different names and to make it, uh, you know, with more names, more nicknames, you know, it's, I think it's make it, you know, complicated for us also. Okay. So if you, if you understand the concept, okay, you can make it very simple because, you know, the blood is the same blood, the plasma is the same plasma, you know, and the gross factor, they can go out and the cells can, can go out. And if you do, you know, with simple, you know, maybe, uh, uh, the speed maybe make a little bit difference, okay? But actually, uh, the same contact you have uh, in every procedure, okay? Yes. yes. It's difficult, very difficult, you know, to go in this resolution and to see that this one is better than that one, and this type of cups is better than this one. So, uh, 
for for that reason you know everyone want to 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 learn this technique i'm trying to make it simple okay and uh, it's work simple yeah Without, okay. Uh, another, you. You know, without without very sophisticated instruments, also you know you can use it with the instrument that you have in your clinic. With the simple, no sophisticated uh, instrument, no sophisticated centrifuge. Do it simple as you can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you both of you uh, for the fantastic presentations.